He is our favorite. And I'm not just saying that because we are two handsome, bald men chomping it up on mm. the Rich Eisen Show. You going to give him the nod? <laughs> I'm giving him the nod. <laughs> What's up, Jay Billis? How are man, you, sir? How are you? Great, Rich. I'm doing great, Rich. How you doing? We did have Larry David on the other day, and he said that bald men should give each other the sort of recognizable nod just passing by. Uh, but he says that if you give that to somebody who doesn't think that they've lost their hair, it could create a very un- t- un- uh, tense situation. I, I saw that, and uh, and I happen to agree with uh, with Larry David on that one because there's still there's still guys like us that ha- are are in denial, <laughs> maybe swirling some things around the top and combing things over. Yes. And uh, Lou Henson, which uh, for instance, yeah, you, could, you remember the Lou the Lou do from back in the day? You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. And uh, there there are a lot of friends of mine that are still still <laughs> holding out hope that there's going to be regrowth and somehow. Uh, you know, maybe they can grow their eyebrows really long and comb them back. Uh, it's not it's not coming back. It's time to wave the white flag and surrender and just give the nod. Uh, good to see you, Jay Billis. Good to see you. Uh, I give you the floor on the UConn men's basketball program and your two cents on them. Jay, it, it's it's remarkable uh, to to win back to back is one thing. And there are very precious few teams that have ever done that. Uh, Florida being the last in 06, 07, and before that it was in the early 90s with Duke in 91 and 92. But the way they did it, uh, it's the first in a long time uh, that they've done it essentially with two different teams because this team is substantially different uh, from last year's team at UConn. And then the fact that they've gone 12 straight NCAA tournament games winning by double digits. Nobody's ever done that. Not the UCLA teams uh, of Wooden, Uh, Not the the great Duke teams of the early 90s, not the Florida teams, not the dominant Georgetown teams. Nobody's done it. And uh, and in an era where we are throwing around the word parity, and I think there is talent spread across uh, the country more than ever, in large part due to NIL and the transfer portal. But UConn has been the most dominant. And one last thing on this, Rich, like, you know, there, there was some talk last year about is UConn now among the blue bloods? And since 1999, this is six titles. Nobody's come close to that. And if you if you go to to 1960, take it back, you know, 50, 60 years, you know, it, half of Kentucky's titles were won before 1960. They won a couple in the 40s and a couple in the 50s. And and even if you go back 50 years, UConn's won as much or more than any program in college basketball history. They're not only a blue blood. You can make an argument now. They're the best program that we've seen since UCLA in the 60s and 70s. It's them and UCLA. Yeah, and that, that's why I kind of find it laughable. And again, it's not my bank account that Dan Hurley's got his 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 uh, you know p's and q's on that. But well, it's laughable they're saying, "Do you want to go to Kentucky?" You know, like, like is this a stepping stone or or UConn is the spot? I mean. Gino R.E.M. is going to the Hall of Fame, or I think he's probably already in it, you know, from UConn. Why why not Dan Hurley? I, I don't understand that concept. Well, I mean, I, I agree with you on the basketball front that there's no better place for Dan Hurley, especially given his background, where he's from, uh, the footprint that UConn has in, in the Northeast and how they can recruit. The only thing I would say that makes uh, a place like Kentucky uh, a, a thought for someone like Dan Hurley or for Dan Hurley specifically is the changing nature of the basketball landscape and the college sports landscape, that things are evolving to the point where if maybe if you're not in a power five league, you can be compromised in the future, that this is still about resources and money. And now that the players are sitting at the table, they're, they're sitting at the kids table now, they're allowed to make something, but they're not realizing their full value. They will soon. And when they do, those resources are going to be important. And and there's a there's a thought that college, college sports may contract a little bit. And the big shots will play amongst themselves. And then everybody else is going to feel like it's uh, – it won't be like this, but it'll feel like it's more of a Division II feel. Um, and, and so that would be the only reason you would look at that, but I don't think Dan Hurley's going anywhere because he, that, that fits him really well. And, uh, and I do think the Northeast connection is really important. Uh, you know, his brother Bobby is out here in Arizona at Arizona state and he's done well, 
but but it's not it's not necessarily who he is. And uh, and so I think Dan Hurley uh, recognizes that. And look, he's at the top at the top of the game and at the top of his game. Uh, so he's going to be fine. Like he'll, he'll get taken care of. But is it is it going to be enough program wise and, and money wise for players and things like that? And is it is it going to be that way for the long term? That's the only reason to consider a place like Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Jay Bill is here on the Rich Eisen show. So would you advocate for for Dan Hurley to 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 maybe consider that like down the road because you're 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 the one who's at the forefront at the uh, you know the vanguard of of knowing what's next and how things might change and uh, so long term would you would you advocate for Dan Hurley to move to Kentucky I, Jay no no I wouldn't advocate moving but I would advocate using the leverage that a move brings. I think for what what the Kentucky opening does is create leverage for other coaches. So whether it's Dan Hurley or Nate Oates or you name it, Scott Drew, it allows you to your university wants you and you're, you've got leverage to say, well, I need this. I need this for my staff. I need this for NIL. I need this for facilities, whatever it is. It's not just a, a necessarily about you. Uh, but hey, look, the, when the schools have leverage over the coaches, they use it <laughs> and co- coaches have to use it, too. And, and I'm one of those that even when I'm at my happiest level, if there's a, why would you not consider another offer? You consider it uh, and think about it. But and, and if it if it helps you, if it gives you leverage, you use it to your benefit. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to go. I don't see Dan Hurley leaving. Um, uh, now or really at any time in the future because things are so good there. But but you certainly should use it to your advantage because your employer will use it to their advantage. Yeah, I think we saw a couple of coaches um, use that uh, Alabama football opening to their advantage to stay put and before Alabama finally, you know, found Kalen DeBoer to come and be the successor to Nick Saban. Jay Bill is here on the Rich Eisen Show. So what is Dan Hurley's secret sauce in this era where, as you pointed out, uh, NIL and Transfer Portal have sort of flattened out the earth in college basketball, Jay? I think it's it comes down to almost one word or concept, and that's relentless. Uh, he's relentless. Everywhere UConn goes, they take with them uh, a poster board of the NCAA championship trophy, and they put it on a little easel at center, you know, sort of off the court, right about center court. And it's present with them all the time. It's it's just their mindset that they're pursuing a championship. And, you know, Dan's got his he's got his little quirks and superstitions and all that stuff. And he, he's he's really funny. He's a great guy and all that. But on the court, there's not much difference between him and a guy like Jim Calhoun and how demanding they are, their players. Uh, but then a minute later, he puts his arm around him and uh, makes everything better. And he recruits players that uh, are willing to, to do that and that have that same sense that, that they don't want to be satisfied with what they just did. Uh, they're, you know, next play mentality. And I know I know people say that a lot. But they actually do it, and uh, and it's really beautiful. But but they're also very modern. Like their offense, and that's one of the things you know. Start comparing this run to the great ones of the past, and is this team one of the greatest ever? I think it is because I think the teams we're talking about, whether it's you know you name it, Florida or Georgetown or Duke or all these different programs, they all those players as great as they were would have a hard time guarding this UConn offense because it's like a European pro offense. Uh, the passing and cutting, they move players around. I mean, it is really difficult to deal with. Doesn't mean they're gonna, not going to have a bad shooting night or something like that. Go three for 17 for three, that happens. But, you know, the, the, the game plan they had against Purdue, I thought was brilliant. They basically said, Zach Eady's going to score. Let's make it really difficult on him. But let's make sure that we're not going to double and open up three point opportunities where we got to close out to one of the best three point shooting teams in the country. And they limited Purdue to seven three-point attempts, which is hard to fathom. And they only made one of those seven uh, because of the the pressure that UConn was able to put on them because they stayed home on shooters. 
And but it's one thing to have that game plan. It's another thing to execute it to that level. And they did. They basically said, hey, Purdue and Zach Eady, you're you're great. But see if you can make enough twos to beat us. And we're not going to put you on the free throw line. And they executed it. And they out they, they beat him in the paint. They out rebounded him. Uh, the guards dominated the Purdue guards. And Purdue is really good. And they were made to look like they weren't by a UConn team that was just frankly better. Jay Bill is here on the Rich Eisen Show. Uh, NBA draft coming around the corner uh, in June. And uh, during the game, uh, when things were getting out of hand, um, I just decided to check on Zach Eady's draft stock. And I'll be straight up with you. I was a little surprised to see there are some who don't even think he's a potential top 20 pick and things of that nature, Jay. Um, and he's a two-time Naismith Award winner here. What, what's Zach's future? do you think Jay? well he's going to play in the nba and as long as he stays healthy he'll play for a long time he's only been playing organized basketball for seven years you know he's from toronto ontario uh grew up playing hockey and baseball and and obviously when you're as big as he is basketball is going to be a part of your life but he has uh he's you could argue rich that he's the most improved player from last year to this year as the national player of the year and the numbers he put up this year, he, I, don't, I don't remember him even having a bad game. He might have had a game where it wasn't up to his standard, but he hadn't had a bad one. And he's the most impactful player in America on the college level. And I think not only is there a place for him in the NBA, there's a significant place. Now, the, the entire game has changed. But it, it, he's not going to be like the, no NBA team is going to all of a sudden turn into a, a low post centric offense. It's still going to be an analytics game about the three-point line and about attacking the rim. But to have a player like that on your team, uh, he's going to play a long time. Now, whether he's drafted in the top 15 or what, th this year's draft is not as powerful as last year's. There's no Wembanyama in this draft. And nobody, you would say, is a transformational talent. But there's a lot of talent. And uh, But, but I, I look at him you know, being a top 15 or top 20 pick. But last year at this time, people were saying he wouldn't even get drafted uh, because the game's changed so much. It hasn't changed that much where a guy that's 7'4 and that effective uh, is not going to find a place in the league. And frankly, I think a number of those players last night, like I think Cam Spencer is going to play in the NBA. Uh, Tristan Newton's going to play in the NBA. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of talent uh, on those teams, but especially a lot of talent on that UConn team that will play at the next level. Hey, man, Tristan Newton's good. That guy, that, that guy is a good basketball player, Jay, and he's proven it. I mean, he's, you know what I mean? It's 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 kind of crazy. You got to pound the table for somebody who is a a a crucial player in a back to back NBA, uh, you know, NCAA men's tournament champion. That guy can play. That guy. Well, can he was play. the he was the Bob Cousy Award winner this year as the nation's best point guard. Uh, he, I think he's got four triple doubles in his career, two of them this year. And, and I think he had, well, maybe he's got five. He had a couple last year as well. Uh, but he's a, he's big. He can rebound. Uh, he's an excellent passer. Uh, and, and he can shoot a little bit. But he's really good getting to the basket. Some of the finishes he had uh, over and around Zach Eady uh, last night I thought were, were outstanding. I mean, he's a, he's a big-time player. And for him, he, he was equally as good last year in the NCAA championship game when they played San Diego State as he was against Purdue last night. I mean, he had 20 points, seven assists, five rebounds, and the last player to do that to go at least 25 and five in a championship game when when, uh, when his team won was Carmelo Anthony back in 2003. And it's not like there haven't been good players in the last 21 years. Yeah, right. And and he's doing that. Uh, he's legit. I agree. And he's a transfer. He was at East Carolina. He's from El Paso, Texas, started his career at East Carolina and then transferred to UConn. And uh, that, that's one of the things about the transfer portal that I love is that players aren't relegated to where they were uh, evaluated out of high school. So we're seeing a lot of these players that go to a mid-major school and they kill it. And they're not they, they don't have to stay there or give up a year of their life if they want to transfer and sit out. You know, you know, now they can transfer to the bigger stage, and, and he he was dominant on that stage. Hey, man, not to sound like you, but I mean, if a chicken magnet can buy out, you know, John Calipari and let him move, 
why can't a player do that and not have a buyout? Just go in the portal. Like, that, uh, honestly, what? It, there's not much different other than just a buyout being put on the table by somebody who's insanely rich who wants his buddy to coach his team. You know what I mean? That, that that's, that's sort of the issue. And I know coaches don't like it when I say this because it sounds kind of snarky, but – you know, the coaches transfer portal is always open <laughs> and and they have contracts and and you have coaches that leave like days after they say, no, this is where I want to be. And they've got, a, you know, John Calipari had a lifetime contract. Well, he knew what lifetime meant when he signed it. <laughs> and nobody, nobody, you don't hear any coaches coming out saying this is wrong. You know, uh, John Calipari is facing a little bit of adversity and he's running away from the adversity. And what about commitment? They don't say any of that stuff. They only say it about players. And players have the same uh, uh, wants and needs as coaches. You know, they they want to they want to be used the right way, and they want to be valued. And their careers are a lot shorter as players. And so, look, I, I get it that there there are difficulties that come with the transfer portal. Uh, roster certainty is more difficult. I get it, and I'm sympathetic to the coaches. I really am but not to the point where you want to restrict player movement without them being compensated. Now, if they were signed to contracts and they had buyouts and all, which is I think where the NCAA will and should go, then I'm fine. Then that, that's fine. Cause those are arm's length negotiations that the player and the university agreed to. But absent that they're just students to be treated like any other student as the NCAA says it. And athletes transfer at a much lower rate than, than, uh, than non-athlete students do. So to me, it's it's much ado about nothing. The players should be able to move uh, until they're compensated appropriately. Jay Billis here on the Rich Eisen Show. So I'll, I'll ask you a sports talk radio question, sending you out to the door, Jay. Um, three Peaton, what do you think? Did, wh- why not, right, for UConn? Why not? Yeah, I wouldn't put it past them because they're going to have players come back. I think there's a very good chance that Donovan Klingon comes back. They're going to lose Kristen Newton and Camp Spencer. Those guys are out of eligibility. And I think Stephon Castle, their freshman, will go into the draft. He's going to be highly rated and uh, and highly coveted. Uh, but having Klingon back and Samson Johnson and some of the guys they have on the bench that are good players, Solomon Ball's a really good player, and they'll go into the portal. They've got really good freshmen coming in. I don't I don't see an end to the national competitiveness just because they're going to lose some players. And look what they lost last year and win it again. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is they, they're the real deal. And Danny Hurley is the real deal. And uh, and they're not going anywhere. N- not at all. What do you think of that moment where <laughs> I, I didn't see it live uh, because the ref seemed to warn Hurley for what I thought was language. And then there was a turnover. Then they gave the ball. They gave the ball to Purdue. And I'm like, what the hell happened? And then the TBS, CBS cameras caught it. He got. He went on the floor. He shoved his player like to say, "Move, you know, like run the play." Uh, what did you think of when you saw that? Jay? I did. I, I was calling the game courtside for ESPN International. Right. So I'm a I'm a huge star in Micronesia right now. Our ratings were through the roof. Uh, but uh, I I didn't see that happen. I was like, "What what happened?" I mean, was it a five second violation or something that he didn't dribble when he was closely guarded? And then we saw the replay as well. And I, I haven't really, honestly, I can't remember having seen that before. I've seen coaches out on the floor and I've seen guys, uh, you know, push a player, you know, to get back in the game or something like that. But I'd never seen it when a guy was actually holding the ball. <laughs> and there was another uh, another exchange after Zach Eady had set a pretty violent pick. There was nothing illegal about it. But he set a pretty violent pick. Right. There was a timeout and he was walking by Hurley and those two exchanged words. <laughs> And uh, and I was thinking, you know, if that doesn't show what a competitor Dan Hurley is, because I think Zach Eady with his left thumb could could crush uh, Danny Hurley like a like a soda, an empty soda can if he wanted to. Um, I just thought I thought it was funny. I, I know he, I'm pretty sure he got warned about that because I saw the officials kind of talking to one another about that exchange. But but I thought, I, overall, I thought it was pretty funny because I, I don't he would have been like Van Gundy hanging on to <laughs> Alonzo Morning, Morning by the ankle. Yeah, I mean, and it probably would have been worse than that. Uh, that that was and that was Van Gundy's toughest moment as a human being. I, I, he showed the most moxie or spunk or whatever other STD you can think of. Oh, my God, because he – he uh, yeah, we had Leitner on the show the other day, Jay, and you talked about meeting Danny Hurley for the first time through Bobby and how he was busting Danny's stones, and it got awkward fast. 
he said it got it got really weird and awkward fast. There, there, well, first of all, there's no one who Leitner wouldn't bust their stones. Right. I mean, I was a grad assistant when he was a player, and uh, he was he was relentlessly brutal in that. But but the Hurley family, you know, that Jersey City stuff, they don't back down to anything. Uh, so I'm not surprised that it got awkward. Before I let you go, Jay, I know you're a golfer. You got a choice for uh, the Masters. What do you think? I I think I think Rory's actually gonna gonna do so like it's it's hard to bet against Scheffler right now because he's been so dominant uh but and he's he's starting to look tiger-esque in that regard I know that's blasphemy to even suggest that but but I think Rory's gonna gonna do something uh this weekend and I hope the weather's good because I can't wait to park myself in front of the tv and watch that I bet I mean but that's like a broken clock's gonna be right once at Augusta right I mean you know it just needs to be it's just every year. The game, the game needs him. The game needs him. And when when he's great, the game's better. And I'm one of those, like, I, I enjoyed watching UConn dominate. And I know other people might want to watch a close game. But I like watching when when, when there's a dominant presence on, on the PGA Tour. That's when I like it the best. I, I think it's awesome. Jay, thanks for the time. You are awesome as well. Um, are you come whenever you're out here in LA? Let me know. I'd love to have you here again. Uh, you're, I'll you're, be out there in July. L- so l- book it. Let's do it. All right, Jay. You be well, sir. Thanks. All right, brother. You bet. That's Jay Billis. Uh, first time I've ever. Uh, of course, uh, he's the odds-on favorite. If I told you there would be a guest who would make a Rich Eisen show first by dropping the word Micronesia, it would be Jay, right? Yeah, no doubt. It'd He's the like, odds on favor. He'd be, oh, it would he'd be, be like plus Sheffler. what? Yeah. He'd be plus what? Uh, well, Scheffler is like plus 430 to win this so, week, so he'd be around okay. Scheffler. He'd odds. be plus 430? Yeah. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern, for free. 